to the Lord and rest in him. Kind of related to that, to that busyness, that even frantic lifestyle that we can have, I think that's one of the one of the hallmarks of Western culture is that we're busy, 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 going, 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 pushing, 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 and we can accomplish a lot that way, but part of that is multitasking, and I think sometimes we can pride ourselves on how we multitask. Look at how many, you know, balls I'm juggling all at this one moment. Look how much I'm getting done, and many studies have shown that we don't actually truly multitask. We can't multitask. Much much research about the brain tells us that we can't do things simultaneously. What we're actually doing, they call task switching. And really, it is like juggling. When you're juggling, you throw a ball up in the air, and then while it's up in the air, you don't worry about it. You're focused on the next one that's falling already, and you catch that one and throw that up. And so you're, you're, holding, you're not holding all the balls at once, only one or two at a time, and that's the way it is with our mind as well. When we have a lot of things going on, we constantly switch from one to the other. And we're giving our attention to only one at a time. And we can switch back and forth very rapidly. And so it seems like we're multitasking, but we're actually not. For instance, this is one reason why talking on the phone while you're driving can be very dangerous. Why do people get in accidents when that happens? Because you're not actually multitasking because you're focusing on one or the other, and so your conversation lapses while you're focused on the road. Has that ever happened to you? Or maybe you get into an accident because you're focused on what you're saying. Have you ever tried this? Have you ever tried to read something, maybe on your phone or a book or an email or something, and, and it's, it's very involved. It's something that takes your focus, and so you're focused on it. Have you ever tried to do that and also carry on a conversation with somebody? It's impossible. It is impossible. I'm trying to focus on this, and they're talking at you, and it actually it happens to me. It makes me very frustrated because I'm trying, I'm trying to focus here. This, this, and, and I either have to give up one or the other, um, and, and sometimes that'll be... So, sorry, I see you're reading. I'll wait to say whatever I'm going to say until you're done because we can't do both at the same time. Maybe they, they've found that if people are trying to multitask, uh, with more than one task, two or three or more tasks, that all of them have two or more decision paths. So if you're, if you're trying, let's say you're in the kitchen and you're baking something and you have to decide whether to leave it in the oven or pull it out of the oven, and then you're on the phone and you're trying to carry on a conversation and what to say, and then somebody else walks into the room and they give you something to look at, and you, all of these decisions... That is something that, that people cannot do. It's, it's our brains, we're incapable of doing it. So this multitasking, again, is really task switching. And when we try to multitask, when we, when we have all of these tasks here at the same time that we're switching from one to the other very rapidly, what happens is our, our ability to evaluate each one and make decisions on each one is impaired. Now we have lesser ability on all of those things. We cannot make multiple decisions that are involved and complicated and we cannot make decisions well and so we end up making poor decisions we we don't evaluate well we make decisions more slowly and you know sometimes if if you are um, let's say talking on the phone and running a vacuum cleaner that's a pretty simple one of them is pretty simple task and sometimes it can be effective to, to have more than one thing going on at once. But when it comes to complicated or very important or very creatively based decisions, we have to give our full attention to that one thing. But I'm thankful that God is not hampered in that way. He carries on conversations with people all around the world all the time, every day. He hears your prayers. He's watching your life. And he's watching all of us. He's, he is not limited. We can only focus on one thing at a time. God is not limited in that way. We can only, we can creatively and, and carefully solve one problem at a time, only one at a time. God has no such restraint on him. And as we try to juggle all the balls, so to speak, in our life, all the decisions and problems and issues that we have we can find ourselves more susceptible to forgetting things or misordering priorities, focusing on the wrong priorities, 
neglecting important factors of each one, and we can get overwhelmed. This is a quick way to get overwhelmed, and maybe you know what that's like. Maybe you've experienced that. But again, God doesn't struggle with any of this. As we look in the scriptures, we see many times that God, that the Bible ascribes human traits to God. And it's not because God is on our level. It's because those traits are things that we can understand. And so when it ascribes human traits or human behaviors to God, it helps us understand in a very limited sense how he operates. And we find one of those this morning, but we need to be careful because we don't want to limit God. We don't want to say, well, the Bible says God does such and such, so that means he's on my level. He is not, he's not on our level, but it does help us to understand approximately how God goes about these things. And what I'm talking about this morning is remembering. There are great blessings that are in store for us, and here's the title of the message, When God Remembers. When God Remembers. Let's pray, and we'll consider what the Bible has for us this morning. Lord, I pray that you would help us to remember. Help us to keep in mind the things that are important. Help us not to uh, dwell and pursue after, think, dwell on and pursue after things that are unimportant, things that are uh, a hindrance to our walk with you. Help us to focus and pursue after and dwell on the things that you care about, the things that you want for us, the things that we ought to focus on, and help us to do that for your glory. Lord, joy will come, peace will come, victory will come when we do that. Help us to rest in you. I'm thankful that you do not have our limitations. You are unlimited. You are infinite. You are all-powerful, and you can do anything, and you will, will do everything for our good. I pray that you would help us to rest in you and praise you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to number or chapter 8 of Genesis, Genesis chapter 8. We're still working our way through this book and still talking about Noah. There are a lot of uh, historical things that are recorded in the scriptures that are interesting for us and no doubt you'll you'll be familiar with this part now Genesis chapter 8 we find that that the flood is decreasing it's going down the the judgment of God I was thinking about how the Bible says the the fountains of the earth were were broken up and water came forth out of the earth to to help to immerse the world in water to judge all of humanity and all the animals and I was thinking about you know, you've, you've probably seen, and we, we know the, the disease that can come when, when a body, an animal, or even a, a person uh, dies and their body decays and, and that kind of thing. That's, why, that's part of the reason why we bury uh, carcasses is because there can be a lot of disease that will come when they lie out on the open. And I was thinking about the water um, killing all the life on the earth and how many bodies there would have been. It's kind of gruesome to think about that. But we know what God did. He buried probably the vast majority of them. That's where we get oil deposits and, and, and uh, uh, coal deposits are from living matter as well. And I just think that was neat for God to not only uh, limit the disease and all the kinds of things that pollute the water at that point, but he also laid up these, these natural resources for future generations. But in chapter 8 of Genesis, Noah is is seeing the water, the, the, the rain has stopped, and it says in chapter 7, verse 24, the waters prevailed upon the earth in 150 days. And let's read the first three verses of chapter 8. It says, And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters assuaged. The fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. And the waters returned from off the earth continually. And after the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. So many ways that God used to make the water go down. And we won't talk about all of that, but I want us to focus on this opening phrase of chapter 8. And God remembered Noah. That phrase is not disconnected from the rest of the chapter. This isn't just, God remembered Noah, and moving on. No, this is all connected. This is all part of it. And I want us to talk about remembering for a minute. First of all, we, we think of the word recall when we talk about remembering. The word recall, we, we know what it's like to remember things. And, and you and I hopefully remembered everything we needed to remember today. The word remember 
the definition for it says to have in the mind an idea which had been in the mind before and which recurs to the mind without effort. Yeah, I've thought of that before and now I'm thinking of it again. I remember it came back to my mind, to my memory. Uh, Another application of this word, when we use effort to recall an idea, we are said to recollect it. This distinction is not always observed. Um, Sometimes we would say uh, we cannot remember a fact, meaning we cannot recollect it. It was in my mind before. I know I know this. I know I've heard this. I, I, I know I've understood and grasped this fact, but I can't recall it right now. I can't remember it. That's what we mean when we talk about remembering. The word forget Again, we would say we forgot it as opposed to remembering it. I've forgotten where I left my keys. Uh, It's probably happened to you. I forgot I had that appointment. We know that we had it. We didn't permanently forget this, but in the moment when we needed that memory, we did not remember it. We did not recall it or recollect it. I have forgotten what I walked in here for. Isn't that embarrassing? That was three seconds ago that I had the thought, and I'm going to have to go back and see if I can recall what the reason was. That happens more times than I care to admit, and it's usually because I'm focused on something else. I'm I'm thinking about this problem, and another thing flashes by my, my thoughts. I'm like, oh yeah, I should go get that. And I'm still thinking about this problem, and I walk into the room, and I say, uh, that distracted me. I don't, I don't know what the other thing was. I don't remember. And for our daily life, we have essentially two possibilities for us, for you and me. We either remember it or we forget it. And I want us to to be careful to not ascribe this to God because it's different and we'll talk about what the Bible says. We either remember or we forget and we, we see this, Genesis chapter 40, verse 20, it came to pass the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants, and he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again, and he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker, as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. Talking about either remembering or forgetting, and it's hard for us to understand how the butler could forget that he had just been in prison and just talked to a man named Joseph who had told him what his dream, how his dream would be, and it came true, and he forgot all about that man. But you and I can do this. Two years later, we know that Pharaoh had a dream, and he was trying to find someone to interpret it. And in verse 9 of Genesis 41, then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. And he talks about what happened. He, he forgot for a while, he did not remember, and then he remembered. And I think God's hand was in that timing. So for us, this is what it is. We either remember or we forget. And it might be permanently forgetting. I, I forgot it, and I don't even realize I forgot it. It's like it was never there. It's never coming back. It might just be a temporary forgetting. Again, I missed the appointment. I knew I had it. I just forgot about it for the moment, for the time. But we either remember or we forget But there is nothing that God cannot recall. There is nothing that God forgets. Oh, what was that again? I don't remember. That doesn't happen with God. He never, there's nothing that slips his mind. He never fails to remember things. So you and I forget or remember. God does not. But it says God remembered Noah. As opposed to what? Well, let's talk about it. Let's see what the Bible says about God. We can think, we often, and this is how it is for us, we think about the words remembering and forgetting in terms of capability. I am capable of remembering, therefore I did. I, I, I wasn't capable of remembering, therefore I forgot. But God uses those concepts about himself in terms of choice. I choose to remember, I choose to forget. And he he doesn't actually, only one time in the Bible that I could find is the word forget connected with God. And I'll show it to you. But I'll show you some other examples that that talk about this remembering and and relating it to God. We just read Genesis 8.1. Genesis 19.29 says, And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. Genesis 30, verse 22, and God remembered Rachel, and God hearkened to her, 
and opened her womb. Exodus 2.24, speaking of Israel and Egypt, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Um, turn to, we'll get to it in just a moment, turn to Hebrews chapter 8. Many times in Scripture, men are shown to have forgotten things. And we just read one of them about the butler. Psalm 78, 9, the children of Ephraim being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They kept not the covenant of, their go of God and refused to walk in his law and forgat his works and his wonders that he had showed them. Psalm 106, 13, they soon forgat his works. Psalm 106, 21, they forgat God their Savior which had done great things in Egypt. Men forget things. God doesn't forget. God doesn't fail to remember. But men do this. We do this quite often. Sometimes, again, we haven't permanently forgotten, but we're so distracted at the moment that we fail to recall. We fail to bring it back to our mind. You know, I, for, I forgot why, I am, why I'm in this room. I forgot why I came in here. We fail to recall. We, we lose the ability to recall something and, and whether we permanently forget or momentarily forget, for, the, for that situation, it's essentially the same thing. It has the same effect. It just, I, I couldn't bring it back to mind. Maybe I will tomorrow, but that doesn't help me now. But God doesn't do this. And he, there's only one time that the word forget is connected with God. It's Hosea 4, 6. And, and notice the purpose and the choice that's reflected in this verse. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. And he's using this word, not, again, not because he's forgetting like you and I do, but he's showing this is the effect it's going to have. This is how I'm going to behave towards you in response to your sin. And it will have the effect as though it completely went out of my mind, okay? But God doesn't fail to remember. He wouldn't be God if he could, but he does do something, and maybe you're thinking of this right now. The Bible does talk about what I was originally thinking of as forgetting, but it's not the same thing. Listen to Jeremiah 31, and then we'll get to Hebrews 8. Jeremiah 31, 33 says, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Remember no more. And you say, well, that's forgetting, right? No, it's not the same thing. God has this sort of middle ground. For us, it's either I remembered it, I recalled it, or I couldn't. I forgot it. But it's almost like God has this sort of middle ground between the two that is his choice. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10, we see a similar language here. Verse, uh, Hebrews 8, 10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. I will be a, to them a God, and they shall be to me a people, and they shall, teach every man his, they shall not teach every man his neighbor. He's quoting Jeremiah. And every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities, while I remember no more. Chapter 10, verse 14. 10, 14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and into their minds will I write them and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. So we have, he says, I will remember no more. So what's he talking about? When it talks about him remembering Noah, when it talks about him remembering Abraham and remembering his covenant, covenant and remembering no more their sins and iniquities, the key is this remembering. And we're going to look at that in Genesis chapter 8. But this word remember also means, in the dictionary, it means to bear or keep in mind, to attend to. 
So you and I, we say, remember when we thought of something yesterday, didn't think of it again until now. I remember. When it's talking about God, it relates to the idea of preserving the memory of. To, re- to put in mind, to think of and consider, to meditate. We have this idea, you know, where did I put that? Where did I put my keys? I forgot. We also have this idea of, here, let me, let me meditate on this thing. Let me keep it in the forefront of my mind. Let me, let me ponder it. Let me think about it. I'm not going to stop thinking about it. And when, when something is very, maybe something exciting is coming up, that's how it is. It's always in our mind. It's always there. That day you were saved, you couldn't think about anything else that day. It was always there. You were remembering it. When we talk about God remembering, he remembers that way. But then when he says, I will remember no more, he says, I am taking this thing and I'm putting it away and I'm not going to to keep it and meditate on it and think about it anymore. He could. He, He hasn't lost the ability to recall. He is putting it out of his mind. It's a choice. I will remember no more. He, he doesn't say, oh, what was it? You know, rather, any of us, he could give our name. What, you know, you did something that was wrong, but I can't think of it now. It's just, boy, I must be getting old. God doesn't, God doesn't live that way. He doesn't forget our sins, but he remembers them no more. And so compared to that, when he remembers us, it's like he's, he's focused on us. If you have multiple children... It's hard. You can't focus on them all at once. When you have multiple tasks going on, you can't focus on them all at once. You're switching back and forth, task switching, and you're, you're juggling back and forth, back and forth. And when you're over here, you're not thinking about that one. God isn't that way. When he remembers us, he's focused on us as though we're the only one in the world. God can do that. And it's a blessing to think about God remembering us. And we're going to talk about when God remembers I'm thankful that God remembers me. I'm glad that he doesn't remember my sin anymore. When he sees me, he sees me without my sin. Because he's chosen to not remember my sin. Because my sin has been taken away in the blood of Christ. And yours as well if you've been saved. We see in Genesis chapter 8, God remembering Noah. And let's turn back there. We're going to see some things that God does when God remembers, when God remembers. And he did some special things for Noah because Noah was living in an ark on an earth covered with water. You and I aren't living that way, but he behaves toward us in similar ways because he is unchanged. Circumstances change. God does not change. God, when God remembers, we see many things that he does and he'll do for us. First of all, when God remembers, God remembers the living. We see he remembers his people. God remembered Noah. Genesis 6, 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And God doesn't drop the ball. He doesn't ignore us. He doesn't forsake us. He doesn't forget us. When you are God's child, he doesn't ever let us down. He doesn't fail us. He will remember us. Psalm 40 says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. Incline means to bend down and turn the ear focus. You do that on purpose. And God does that for us. He brings us out. Psalm 40, he brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, set my feet upon a rock, established my goings, put a new song in my mouth. He remembers us. Psalm 13, we won't read it for sake of time, talks about David complaining that God has forgotten him. And we find that word forgot or forgetting or something connected with God when humans are accusing God or or wondering, God, did you forget me? But God never says, except that one Hosea reference, God never connects that word with himself because he doesn't forget us. He doesn't fail to remember. We forget him. We forget our blessings from God. But in Psalm 13, David goes from complaining that God has forgotten him to praising God for remembering him. God does remember us. Psalm 103, verse 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all his benefits, 
who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction. Don't forget his benefits. We can forget, and we can so easily complain, and, and for a while we can just be focused on our problems and our trials, and we think God's forgotten us, because look at these things. This is proof. God's forgotten us. And in, the, in that attitude, that heart condition, we're forgetting God's blessings. We're forgetting who he is. He hasn't forgotten us. God remembers God remembers his people. Hebrews 6.10, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. God is not unrighteous. It would be unrighteous to forget those things. He does not forget those things. He remembers his people. The rest of verse 1 of Genesis 8, it says that not only does God remember his people, he remembers his creation. And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. God remembers all of it. It's right here in the forefront of his mind. He's holding on to these thoughts. He's meditating on. He's focusing on. He's pondering. He's, he's focused on. You and I have to give our focus to something in order to retain memories, in order to learn, in order to... to, to to behave toward it as we should. If you don't give attention to a conversation, it'll leave your mind as if it never happened. You meet somebody for the first time, and, and I found myself uh, having a tendency to do this, and I meet somebody, maybe their name is, you know, Jim or John or something, and I've, I've met a lot of people named Jim or John, and my mind says, oh, this is a familiar name, and I don't think about it again, and I forget their name. What was your name again? Oh, yeah, I should have remembered that, <laughs> but I didn't focus on it. I didn't put my attention on it, and, and so I didn't retain it. God's not like that. When he remembers us, his focus is on us all the time. His people, he, he remembers his people. God sometimes judges us and his creation in ways that we do not understand. That's what happened with Noah. But he does not forget his creation. Luke 12, 6, Jesus says, Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God? What are sparrows? They're cheap, right? They're common. They're everywhere. They're, they're nothing. Well, God doesn't forget them. He remembers them. He remembers his creation. He remembers his people. I'm thankful that God keeps us in mind. He thinks of us and considers us. He meditates on us. He remembers us, and he remembers you. Not only does God just, when God remembers us, he cares for us. It says, all the cattle that was with him in the ark. That represented God's provision. The ark was God's protection and God's provision. He cares for us. I'm reminded of the, of the hymn. Fanny Crosby wrote the lyrics to the hymn, He Hideth My Soul. And I think of the ark in this context. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. A wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers of pleasure I see. That, that ark was that protection a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. He taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up, and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. With numberless blessings, each moment he crowns. And filled with his fullness divine, I sing in my rapture, O oh, glory to God, for such a Redeemer is mine. When clothed with his brightness, Transported I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand. And covers me there with his hand. How is all of that true? Because he remembers us. He cares for us. He protects us. This is what God, this is what it means for God to remember you. I imagine Noah and his family were probably a bit shaken at all of the destruction around them and how every, everything had changed. They're in this boat and they're safe and they know they're safe, but everything else was, it was gone. Everything they knew was gone destroyed the, the 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 earth is different mountains created valleys created rivers and oceans that weren't there before but they were safe god had covered them in the cleft of the rock with his hand 
He had protected them perfectly and completely. God remembered them. And if you are God's child, God remembers you. He protects you perfectly and completely. Everything all around you may be different, but God protects us. He cares for us by preparing the way. Not just protecting us, but preparing the way. It talks in verse 3 of Genesis 8, the waters returned, meaning they, they went down, they, they decreased. And verse 4, the ark rested in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountains seen. God was preparing a way for them to leave the ark and resume human life. He cares for us by preparing the way. The ark was a perfect deliverance from the flood, but it wasn't a perfect place to live permanently. God knew this, and he was preparing the way for people and the living creatures on the ark. Can I remind us? God knows exactly what your next step should be and what your needs will be. He knows exactly what they are. He remembers you. He is bearing you in mind or keeping you in mind. He's attending to you. He's preparing the way. He cares for us by encouraging us. Noah, in verses 6 to 14, and we won't take the time to read all of them, Noah opened the window of the ark in verse 6. He sent forth a raven. Verse 8, he sent forth a dove. And the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot in verse 9, and she returned to the ark. Seven days later, he sent the dove again out in verse 10. Verse 11, the dove came in to him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. No, so, so no one knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. That was encouraging for him. That gave him some, some progress reports. How are we doing? It looks maybe, maybe he was on the mountain. He couldn't really see over the, over the edge of the boat and see what the land looked like. Let's send out a bird. She came back with an olive leaf. Hey, we're, there's progress here. This is encouraging. And in verse, four, uh, verse um, 12, he stayed yet other seven days and sent forth the dove, which returned not again unto him anymore. The dove found another place to live. Soon it will be our turn. That's encouraging. God encourages us. There was much that Noah did not know about the future, about the past, but there were some things that he did know. He knew that the flood was over. He knew the waters were receding. He knew that the dove could survive on her own without help in the ark. These were encouraging signs in a positive direction. He could have focused on what he didn't know and been fretting about it. But he, get, he had encouraging signs from the Lord, and God encourages us as well. He encourages us because he remembers us. Another part of God's remembering us is God commissioning us. We need a mission from the Lord. We need him to commission us and say, go do this. I've got a job for you. I want you to be busy. This is part of him remembering us. Look at verse 15. And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. There's something next. For, I've got the next step for you. It's time for you to go forth. It's time for you to leave the ark. It has fulfilled its purpose. Does it comfort you when God gives you direction? It should. If we trust the Lord, we know that God's not leading us into an ambush to destroy us. We know it's a good direction. We know it's a good thing. Lord, just tell me what to do. As long as I've got something, a commission from you, that's all I need. It might be hard, yeah. It might be sorrowful, yeah. But, but it's good because God said to do it. Noah could have said, well, what's out there? I'd rather stay in the ark. You know, I, I know the ark. The ark is, is, is comforting to me. The ark is known, the con confines of the ark. I feel secure here, Lord. But he probably knew, and God certainly knew, the ark was not a place of permanent life and permanent residence. It served its purpose. And now I've got something else for you. He gives direction. Go. Unless we are self-willed and rebellious, God's direction will always encourage us. If we don't want to do what God says, then we're going to be upset and frustrated and, and annoyed or, or disappointed. But if we just want what God wants, it will always encourage us when he gives direction. He commissions us. He also gives responsibility. God said in verse 16, Go forth, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives. Verse 17, Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee, of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. Bring them out. This is your job. 
This is what I want you to do. I want you to go forth, and here's your responsibility. Take them with you. They need to multiply and replenish the earth. God remembers us. He cares for us. He remembers his people. He remembers his creation. He protects us. He prepares the way. He encourages us. He commissions us. And what should be our response? Well, Noah shows it to us. It says, and Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing and every fowl and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kinds went forth out of the ark. We, we jokingly say, oh, if only Noah would have just squashed those two mosquitoes on the ark. You know, our life would be so much better. If only Noah had just killed those snakes. I mean, if he couldn't he have just offed those pythons and we wouldn't have to worry but he kept his responsibility. God said every creature, everything, you take them out. He did his job. He, re- he obeyed. When God remembers us and God leads us and encourages us and commissions us and directs us and prepares our way, we must remember him. That is our job. That is our responsibility. And this focus, again, I'm not talking about, oh, I, j- I feel like there's something I should be remembering something about how this world got here, something about my salvation, but I can't remember. I'm not talking about that forgetting. I just forgot all about, I forgot God existed. No, we must remember him by keeping him in the forefront of our minds. Always, this is the overriding, the all-important focus and thing that I meditate on. I don't ever go days without thinking about God. I don't forget his works. I don't forget his goodness. He is always in the forefront of my mind. When you're taking a walk with someone, friend, a spouse, and you're walking and you're, you're observing things, you're talking, their presence is always there. It's, al- it's always in the forefront of your mind. You think about other things too, but they're with you, and God is with us, and our mind must be with him. We must remember him. He doesn't forget about us. He remembers our sin no more, but he doesn't forget us. He doesn't forget his people. He remembers us. And and he is so gracious to initiate conversation and work with us, but we need to seek to honor him purposefully. 1 John 4.19 reflects this. It says, we love him because he first loved us. And I'm so thankful that God is merciful to speak to us. We wander from him. We run from him. We, We resist him and we forget him. And he does not forget us. He continually is drawing us back, continually seeking and working and speaking to us. We must remember him. We should not misplace or lay aside our thoughts of him. We must keep them fresh every day. We must walk with him every hour. If you see your own sinful flesh properly, you understand that you need God in order to serve him. You need his help in order to do right. And so we can pray every day, God, I know I'm going to fail spiritually unless I have your help. Please help me. But I believe he wants us to remember him for for better reasons than that. As in, God, I need you not not just because of what I have to do, but just because I want you. Even Even if you don't have, if you could, if it were possible, you don't have a job for me today, I still want your presence. If it were possible for there to be no sin to tempt me today, no possibility of sinning today, I still want your presence. I still want to fellowship with you. I still want to know your person and to, and to be in, in, in communion with you. I want you. And yes, that will bring victory over sin. That will bring power in witnessing. That will bring joy. But I don't want you just for those things. I want you for you. I want you for your person just because you are you we should have that attitude towards the lord we must remember him and there are some tangible ways to remember him that noah shows us it says he went forth we obey we must obey that's how we remember god verse 20 it says noah builded an altar unto the lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar not only should we obey? This was a continued pattern of obedience for Noah. Genesis 6, it says, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him. So did he. This was a pattern of his life, and it should be for ours as well. But not only did Noah obey, he went forth, took the animals out with him, but it says he builded an altar. He worshipped. 
How do we remember God? We obey him and we worship him. Noah sacrificed of himself. He took the time and the effort to build an altar. And he used the blessings in God's creation and sacrificed that unto the Lord. He worshiped the Lord. How do we worship God? Do we worship God? Do we take the time? How do we worship him? We worship him in putting him first. We worship him by praising him, by serving him. We worship him by giving offerings, by giving, sacrificing our time, our energy, serving others. These are all ways that we worship the Lord. This is how we remember him. But too often we get our priorities. We, we pursue what we want. We focus and we remember the things that are important to us. And they're always temporal things, sometimes sinful things. We're focused, and it's like a, a bloodhound tracking down a raccoon. Doesn't, doesn't swerve from the path constantly after the quarry. That's how we behave. But we need to have that attitude towards God. Constantly seeking, constantly following after, constantly trailing. Nothing can distract us. Nothing can pull us aside. It doesn't matter what kind of brambles that dog runs through, what kind of trees are in his way. He continues out on the trail. Let's behave that way towards God. Constantly remembering and when we remember that way, again, I mentioned the spot on the glass with the car disappearing into the distance. We won't have, we're, we're still sinners, so we will fail. But as long as God is our focus, we won't have problems with perspective. We won't have problems. Boy, this trial, I don't know, I don't know what God's going to, no, we won't have that attitude. I don't know what God's going to do, but I know he's going to do something. I know he, I, he's master. He, it's no problem for him. I don't need to be worried about it. This is our response when we constantly remember him. And notice what the Lord does in response to Noah's remembering him. Genesis 8, 21. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living, everything living as I have done. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. The chapter starts by saying, and God remembered Noah. And the chapter ends with God saying, I will never again do this. I'm giving my word. As long as the earth is continuing, this kind of judgment, this flood will not happen again. I'm going to remember that. I'm not going to forget that I made that promise. I'm not going to forget that I wasn't going to judge this way. You can count on it. And so God remembers us and he prepares the way. He encourages us. He com commissions us. And when we follow him and we remember him and we submit ourselves to him, he continues to remember us. God intended for life to be a sweet cycle, a reciprocating pattern of remembering. He remembers us and gives us what we need. We remember him and give of ourselves willingly and obediently. And he remembers us and blesses us. And we remember him and we thank him and worship him and honoring him, honor him. And the cycle just continues. God remembers and he, he blesses us. Again, the word remember to bear or keep in mind, to attend to, to preserve the memory of, to put in mind, to think of and consider, to meditate. Do we remember him? He can't forget us, but we can fail to recall him as we should. When God remembers, he protects us, prepares our way, encourages us, and commissions us. He gives us everything we need. A lot of things we wish we had, but he gives us everything we need because he remembers us. He knows exactly where we are, who we are, what we need, what we don't have, and he gives us everything we need. May we remember him and we'll willingly give him what he desires from us. And when we do, we have that fellowship with God and blessing and victory from the Lord. I'm so thankful that God remembers us. Let's remember him. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would encourage us, but also challenge us. It's so easy, so easy for me to look at 
things that happen. I'm surprised by such and such. I didn't expect it. And immediately when something like that happens, I go into emergency management mode as though I have to take care of it all and I forget God. I'm focused on me. I'm focused on the other thing. And I forget. It's as though God doesn't even exist. Completely out of my mind. And I'm convicted by that. I'm ashamed of that. Lord, I'm so thankful that you don't forget us. You remember us. And when we're saved, you put away our sin and you do not meditate on that anymore. You put it out of your mind. You put it away and you don't consider it anymore because it's been taken away in the person of Jesus Christ. I pray for those who are here today that are lost. Lord, you still remember their sin. You still remember their judgment. You still meditate and focus on their condemnation. I pray that they would be saved so that you will remember their sin no more. But help us to trust you. That you always remember your people. You will never forget us. Help us to not forget you. Help us to worship you and praise you and serve you today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for your attention this morning. We'll be dismissed for the next few minutes. Begin our service again at 11 o'clock.